Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I wanted to uh, start with some few passages from the Quran, and the Quran is uh, literally means a reading or a recital, and so they're usually <coughs> recited. So I was going to recite uh, a few verses and then look at Dr. Cleary's translation of them. creating you all from dust, and there you are, humankind, propagating wisely. And among the signs of God is having created for you mates from yourselves, that you may feel at home with them. And God put love and kindness among you, surely in that is a sign for reflective people. And among the signs of God is the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the diversity of your languages and your complexions, surely in that is a sign for the knowing. The Qur'an itself is called uh, a book of signs, and the, in fact the word that is used for verses in Arabic literally means signs. And what the Qur'an essentially is telling us is that creation is signs, that the whole of existence really is signs, and that the Qur'an itself uh, is signs for people to, in a sense, decode the signs outside of themselves. And what the importance of that is, is that we tend to forget about signs and we tend to, uh, most people go through life really not reflecting on, on the signs. The Quran talks about signs in yourself and in the horizon. And another unfortunate matter, and a good example from this passage in the Quran, is it says, from your tongue and your complexion, the, that these in themselves are signs of God. And, and what people tend to do is uh, misread those signs and say, for instance, uh, because a person is white, uh, they see that as a sign that they're superior to somebody that is black, for instance. And so the result is, is that signs become a, uh, when they're misunderstood, have tragic consequences. Uh, the Quran itself uh, reminds us in the, in the chapter called The Merciful, that God uh, created man, or humankind, and taught them speech. And this teaching of speech really is bayan, which is articulation, or a way of articulating the signs. And this is the gift of language, is it is a way of articulating reality. And the I think the importance of this book, in my mind, and Dr. Cleary's translation in particular for Western people, is that we're living in a time where uh, people would like to see confrontation. There are a lot of people that have vested interest in confrontation. Uh, I, to give a recent example in a, an article put out by the Foreign Policy uh, Journal, which is the Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations, there was an article there that described the world as being divided into three, uh, three sections, the Confucian, the Islamic, and the uh, Christian or the Western. And uh, this man saw the, the 
confrontations of the future would be between these different blocks. And unfortunately, if things continue as they're going, that scenario is not that uh, unlikely. But what I think Dr. Cleary is trying to do is, is give us tools right, to break down some of those barriers. And uh, that's why I think his work is uh, so extremely important. In fact, I, I really personally believe that it, it's some of the most important work going on, period. Because uh, if, if that scenario is true, then we, we need to learn about the, the people of the East as opposed to seeing them as enemies seeing them as people, uh, that they are signs themselves, and also the uh, the Islamic people, as opposed to seeing them as enemies, seeing that they are signs of God as well. And so that's what uh, he's giving us, because I think the, the Quran describes itself as, as a book of signs, but we need to decode the signs. And what he is enabling Western people to do is, by putting it into the symbols that we understand, um, he's giving us the tools of looking at it and being able to decode for ourselves what is beneficial uh, for us. And there's certainly a great deal in there, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what Dr. Cleary has to say about the benefits of Islam for the West. So with, uh, without going on any further, I'd like to welcome Dr. Cleary and thank the new school and Dr. Cleary for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Are we on okay? I think it's um, interesting that um, <clears throat> Imam Hamza and I picked out some of the same passages to read tonight uh, without prior discussion, I might add. Now the question, can the West learn from Islam? Well, I think it's pertinent to point out that the West has learned from Islam already. Let me read a brief passage from an article which I think summarizes this um, quite well. Interestingly, this article is from a magazine uh, devoted to economic issues entitled the magazine called Futures. It's published in the United Kingdom. The uh, subject of the article was the um, importance of the cultural aspect of international uh, trade and diplomatic relations. <clears throat> this regards the relation of Islam and the West. I quote, Islamic revivalism <clears throat> can be interpreted as the second intervention of Islam in trying to bring Western I repeat, Western civilization into balance. When Europe of the Middle Ages, preoccupied with a religious supremacy which even ruled over reason and science, it was Islam which reintroduced Greek rationalism and science into Europe. As pointed out by Northrop, Islam gave the West through its Arabian universities in Spain much of the source material and the Enlightenment which made the West what it now is. Today, Islam is trying to reintroduce the idea of the holy into a Western society which has enshrined the market as a religious tenet. I picked out a number of topics uh, to focus on in pursuit of this question, the issue of um, what's referred to here as the second intervention of Islam in trying to balance Western society, reintroducing the idea of the holy into everyday society. Uh, I'd like to focus on uh, mental culture first, then leadership, business, society, home, and uh, individual conscience and conduct. Now, as far as mental culture is concerned, the Prophet said, seeking knowledge is incumbent on every Muslim. He also said, the word of wisdom is the stray of the one who believes, who has the better right to it, wherever it may be found. And the fourth um, successor of the Prophet, Ali, said, lay hold of wisdom, Wherever it is, for wisdom stammers in the heart of the hypocrite until it leaves and comes to rest by its leg in the heart of a believer. So I think that the idea of seeking uh, knowledge um, without preconceived boundaries to whom the knowledge belongs, whom, for whom it's appropriate, is something that we certainly can use uh, here in the West. I think particularly uh, we need today human understanding on a level to catch up with the... Um, the power of the, the political and economic and technological developments that have already taken place. And at the same time, I think that um, this uh, that human knowledge, knowledge of human nature, human understanding, needs to be generalized enough, widespread enough, so that um, understanding of human 
uh, psychological weaknesses in particular cannot be used uh, to manipulate uh, people quite so much. Now, in particular, the Quran uh, recommends knowledge of human history. For example, in the chapter on Rome, it says, Travel the earth and see how those before you ended up. Again, I think that in, in a democratic society where, to some extent, uh, individuals are responsible, at least in theory, for the behavior of their governments and societies, <clears throat> it's rather important to understand what the prospects of given attitudes and uh, policies really are. And one way of doing that is understanding uh, what has already happened, what's already been tried, what's taken place uh, on the face of the earth. Here, I think this is an area that is especially weak in uh, our educational system. Um, I understand that history, of course, is a difficult subject um, because it is inherently impossible to record all of the relevant data. And so I think part of the, the uh, study of history needs to be, uh, again, a study of um, the kinds of subjective biases that enter into the reporting and the understanding of history. I think that's particularly important for us today because our general knowledge of history is is um, heavily interlarded with um, political expediency and uh, also with a great deal of fantasy. I think the popularity of fantasy in this culture has gotten a bit out of hand to the point where it invades subjects like history uh, and unfortunately can um, influence uh, attitudes in a detrimental way because it, it, it really doesn't equip us to deal with realities or to be able to have some sense of uh, foresight in predicting how uh, particular attitudes uh, and policies will, the types of results they're likely to produce. Now we've already heard the passage uh, from, this again is from Rome, among the signs of God is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the diversity of your languages and your complexion. Surely in that is a sign for the knowing. Now, a sign of what? Later on, um, in the chapter of the chambers, the apartments, the Quran explains the purpose, the, the meaning of this sign in one sense. O humankind, it says, we created you from a male and a female, and we made you a plurality of races and tribes for you to know each other. Then it goes on to say, the most noble of you, in fact, in God's perspective, is the most conscientious of you. So I take this to mean that people of different races and tribes are not superior or inferior to each other by virtue of their membership in a particular race or tribe, but by virtue of their individual qualities. In a pluralistic society such as we live in here, I think uh, it's imperative for us to learn how to uh, appreciate people and deal with people on the basis of their their individual qualities as they really are. Obviously, stereotypes won't really do the job. Now, let me give an example um, of why I think this need is so very critical here in America at this time, not only for uh, the internal peace and harmony of this society, but for the peaceful coexistence of this society with other societies on the face of the earth. Now, the prophet also is reported to have said, seek knowledge even as far as China. Now, for the moment, I'll, I'll take that literally and uh, quote a recent statement um, by a scholar, a university professor, on the subject of uh, Chinese thinking, perception, and cognition. Now, I would like to point out that this was written in 1993, which is um, approximately 218 years after the initiation of commercial relationships between the United States and China. I don't know how well known that fact is, but the uh, first ships from America sailed for China the year after the revolution. That was one reason why the Northeastern merchants wanted to be free from England. Anyway, so here's what we've learned, and here's what other fans are saying after 200 years of acquaintance. <clears throat> and I quote, uh, there seems to be little concern, this is about China, Chinese thinking, there seems to be little concern to recover an intelligible pattern from what seriously threatens to remain formless and meaningless. Jorge Luis Borges captures this Western perception in his well-known citation of, quote, a certain Chinese encyclopedia, unquote. 
in which the category animal is divided into one, belonging to the emperor, two, embalmed, three, tame, four, suckling pigs, five, sirens, six, fabulous, seven, stray dogs, eight, included in the present classification, nine, frenzied, ten, innumerable, eleven, drawn with a very fine camel hair brush, twelve, etc., thirteen, having just broken the water pitcher, and fourteen, that from a long way off look like flies. Now the, the distinguished uh, scholar continues, <laughs> summing up this vast body of evidence. <laughs> uh, from the perspective of the more rationalistic Western point of view, the penalty the Chinese must pay for the absence of that underlying metaphysical infrastructure necessary to guarantee a single ordered universe is what we take to be intelligibility and predictability. Now then, can you imagine what international trade and diplomacy could be like based on this type of idea? Now this individual is not only a professor, he's director of the Center for Chinese Studies at a certain university whose name, over whose name I will draw the curtain of charity, uh, described I might add, as one of the leading interpreters of Chinese philosophy in America today. Uh, this book uh, is described in these terms. The author's understanding of the philosophical and cultural background make this the most profoundly erudite and intellectually stimulating translation and analysis of the great Chinese military classic. Well, uh, first of all, uh, what interests me is that this individual doesn't even understand the writing of uh, this um, Brazilian Jorge Luis Borges, who was just died a few years ago, a contemporary writer, Westerner. Uh, he was a surrealist, and uh, he liked to uh, point out that there are many different ways of looking at reality. And this is exactly what he's talking about in this passage from this mythological, there's no such Chinese encyclopedia, for heaven's sake. You know, <laughs> this book, this scholar. And I noticed he didn't put a footnote on this, you know, where, where you can find this encyclopedia. Anyway, so first of all, he doesn't understand his own the, the forefront of his own civilization. And, you know, the idea that the Chinese have sacrificed intelligibility and predictability, I mean, please, how can you have a language without intelligibility or predictability? I mean, that language is a vehicle of intelligibility and predictability. It means that people have one of the most sophisticated written languages um, in the world. Well, um, let me just conclude this disgraceful chapter with... Uh, an actual quote from a genuine Chinese proverb that illustrates, I think, both the nature of this type of uh, scholarship and the danger in society of projecting this type of material as though it were any, anything serious or real. And that proverb goes as follows. When one dog barks, a thousand dogs howl. <laughs> Of course, no conception of predictability in there. All right, let me turn to leadership. Obviously, um, we can only uh, hope and pray that the leaders of our nation do not uh, go to centers of Chinese studies to learn about what, what the Chinese have on their mind. Now, uh, as far as leadership is concerned, um, this is something that I really believe in a democratic society is... Uh, and really imperative for everyone to study issues of leadership, whether or not they're formally in uh, position of leadership. And this not just because uh, of the responsibilities of being a member of a democratic society, but it's also the responsibilities of uh, managing yourself. Now, here in, in America particularly, where we don't have much in the way of extended family, or lots of us don't anyway, and the... Uh, the fabric of society, in some senses, is rather looser than in, shall we say, more traditional societies. The responsibility of managing oneself and taking care of one's own business, therefore, becomes more and more critical the more one is left uh, to one's own devices. Let me begin by quoting, um, again, Ali, the fourth successor of the Prophet, who said, Whoever sets himself up as a leader of other people should start educating himself before educating others and let him teach by his conduct before teaching by his tongue. And the education and refinement of oneself is more worthy of respect 
than the education and culture of other people. And in the Quran, we have actually many examples of recommendations for behavior that could be referred to requisites of leadership. An example is in the chapter in Luqman. Adopt the middle course in your walk and lower your voice. For the worst of sounds is the brain of an ass. You should always keep that in mind around election time. <laughs> a flash on the television. <laughs> These guys get up there and give their speeches. Uh, now, I've singled out a number of things of the Prophet, which I think are relevant to dealing with the uh, requirements of leadership in terms of sincerity, truthfulness, modesty, fairness, and justice. The Prophet said, Anyone whom God has placed in charge of the citizenry, but who does not take care of them sincerely, will not even get a sense of paradise. The Prophet also said, God forbids paradise to any ruler of a Muslim citizenry who dies while he is deceiving them. In one of his most interesting sayings, we do not assign authority to one who asks for it or to one who covets it. Can you imagine what elections would be like under those conditions? <laughs> Have to catch the ones who are running away fast. <laughs> but I think it's a, it is a very cogent point, the idea that you know, public service should be public service, not for the, the uh, privileges and perks um, that the individuals who are in those positions may may gain. And I think among the citizenry of this country, there is a really a great cry for this kind of authentic uh, morality uh, in, among the, the uh, politicians and the leaders. And here's another example, I think, in which there is a great public outcry for this type of fairness. The prophet said, what destroyed those before you was that whenever an aristocrat among them stole, they would let him be. But when one of the powerless among them stole, they would inflict the legal punishment on him. I think that's worth thinking about. Now, I, here, if you steal enough, they give you a professorship. <laughs> 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 Teach other people how to do it, you know, without getting caught. <laughs> oh, well. Once when the Prophet was sending one of the companions to the Yemen to be the governor, he said, Beware the plea of the oppressed, for if there is no screen between it and God. Now let me turn to business matters. I think the, uh, in the passage uh, from the uh, Futures magazine I quoted um, at the outset, I think the uh, point of, about the West having enshrined the market as a religious tenant is, is well taken. And I think that it's a legitimate criticism in that it really it, uh, it leaves out uh, too much of the whole human being in order to be a, a satisfactory uh, guide a standard for uh, what a human life should be. Let me begin by quoting the Quran um, from the chapter um, Women. Do not consume your wealth among yourselves in vain, but may there be trade out of mutual consent among you. Here I think the uh, expression mutual consent is important to remember. Now there's quite a bit in the things of the Prophet about business ethics. I think this is a fascinating subject. I've just got a couple here which illustrates fundamental principles, one of which is the idea of um, generosity, charity. The Prophet said, May God be merciful towards someone who is generous in buying, in selling, and in demanding payment. The Prophet also said, There was a man who lent money to people. He used to say to his servant, When you give to someone who is poor, be forgiving, that God may be forgiving to us. And that man met God, and God pardoned him. Now we come to some more uh, technical um, things, which has to do with the actual structure of an economy. Let me quote the Quran on this one first. Whatever you give from excess profit, that it may grow even more invested in people's wealth, does not increase with God. But what you give in charity, seeking the presence and favor of God, is what will be compounded. Whatever you give from excess profit that it may grow even more invested in people's wealth does not increase with God. Now, you ever wonder why on the news when they tell you they're going to make a report on the economy, they tell you what the Dow Jones average is today? <laughs> like that's the state of affairs? Uh, that money is not in the economy, <laughs> actually, <laughs> if you think about it. <clears throat> Some years ago, there was a controversial book um, partially translated here in America called The Japan That Can Say No, and one of the authors 
was the chairman of the Sony Corporation. And uh, this was his criticism, one of his main criticisms of American business, that um, money was regarded as a means of making money and not as a means of fostering production. Now, the profit uh, forbade people to resell foodstuffs they had purchased unless and until they had received full measure and had paid the price in full. Now, I take this to mean something similar, that uh, arbitrage and speculation are not really honorable ways of making money and are not really good for the, the whole body of the economy. I think we've already had the proof of that. Um, this is one reason why I find these ancient injunctions uh, so interesting. Now, here are some general statements about business ethics. And this, uh, by the way, is one of the so-called sacred hadith. This is uh, a saying not of the prophet, but a saying the prophet relates as having uh, been revealed by God, but not included in the Quran. The prophet said, God has said, I will be the adversary of three types of people on the day of resurrection. Those who offer in my name, but then betray their promise. Those who sell a free individual and consume the price obtained. And those who hire workers and have work done, but do not give them their wages. <clears throat> well, now let me turn to some general things uh, having to do with society. Here again, I think these are areas where the need that we have here is quite obvious from our everyday experience of what we see and hear. You read some definitions of righteousness from the Quran. In the chapter on the cow, it says, it defines the righteous in these terms. Those who donate goods and money in spite of their love for it, to relatives and orphans, and to the poor and the wayfarer, and to the needy, and for freeing slaves. And it continues. And those who fulfill their promises when they make them, and who are patient in suffering, adversity, and hard times, they are the truthful ones, and they are the conscientious. And also, it says, Do not nullify your charities by reminders of your generosity, or by abusive behavior, as do those who spend their wealth to be seen by the people. I think that's a particularly pertinent passage. The idea that uh, charitable deeds, whether individual or collective, shouldn't be just for show. They should be effective. This is why I think that... Um, in rebuilding a society that's fraying, it's uh, really critical to build it from its real membership, which is the people, rather than to imagine that all we need to do is articulate programs and um, pass legislation. Now, the family of Imran also has a good definition of the conscientious. They are those who are generous in good times and bad, and who withhold anger and to pardon people. In the chapter on women, it says, Be good to your parents and relatives, and to orphans and paupers, and to neighbors close by and neighbors remote, and to the companion at your side, and to the traveler, and to your ward. Now, there's a great deal of uh, mention of charity in Islam. I find it quite um, edifying that uh, statements of the Prophet about charity include both self-support and giving to others at the very, at the most basic level of individual economic independence. The Prophet said, charity is incumbent upon every Muslim. People ask him, O Prophet of God, what about one who has nothing to give? The Prophet said, then one works with one's hands to support oneself and to give to others. They ask, and if one cannot find work? The Prophet said, then one should be good and refrain from evil. For that, in fact, is charity for the one who does so. Now, that's not all so hard. Um, once again, I do think that perhaps the most edifying thing about this attitude is the idea that whatever you're, um, whatever that you're doing, even if it's working for your own support, already <laughs> charity for others is uh, involved as part of your, as a part of your task. I think this is a, uh, a natural recognition of the, the basic, um, the social nature of the human being. And the basic uh, attitude reflecting this recognition is illustrated in this saying of the Prophet, none of you is a believer until you like for others what you like for yourself. Now, of course, when we think about that, we need to think about what we like for ourselves. 
and whether that is really something worthwhile. One thing in particular, I think, um, on the subject of uh, Western society and the possibility of learning from Islam, we might uh, focus our attention on this, um, well, I might now call it a market niche almost, uh, entitled Men's Spirituality. I guess it's from a catalog that just came the other day, quite felicitously. And um, let me just read uh, a couple of the uh, descriptions of the books under the subject of men's spirituality, which I think will uh, underscore the need for or the possible use of some of the Islamic teachings on, on living in society. Uh, here's one about, uh, this is the subtitles, Reflections on Becoming a Man. And uh, it says, the author wrote these essays because, quote, it is increasingly hard to grow up male in America. There are no rites of passage. Fathers are at a loss of words when discussing what it means to be a man. The male child grows up uncertain who he is, uncertain who he should be. We are born now. We must learn to be men. Life is tough. Mm. Now here's another one, Inside the Men's Movement. This book takes you behind the scenes of one of the most important and least understood phenomena of recent times. What is driving men in ever-increasing numbers into the woods to be drums and share grief <laughs> that they can't articulate in their everyday lives? What are men discovering that keeps them coming back to support groups week after week? Now, I don't uh, know myself. Uh, I don't go to these things, so I can't answer this. What are they discovering? But I, I do think that there is some relevant uh, teaching in the Quran about this. Uh, I, and I quote, There is no good in most of their private conferences, except those who enjoin charity or justice, or reconciliation among people. Now, the prophet said, one who looks after the widowed and the poor is like the warrior who struggles in the way of God, or like one who prays all night and fasts all day. So what I would like to ask is, while those guys are out in the woods beating the drums, what about the widows? Are they out there discussing what they can do about the widows and the poor? I certainly hope so. I also hope there are no weekend workshop widows. <laughs> you know, there's luck kinds of widows in this civilization. You know, we even talk about football widows and baseball widows, things like that. Uh, I think we will find the abject failure of, of movement, social movements, that whose real aim should be uh, reconciliation among people, reintegration. I think we will find them to be abject failures if they do actually create a new type of widowhood, so we say. <clears throat> so, uh, fellows, if you want to be a man, uh, it's not that there is no advice. For example, the prophet said, when a man spends money on his family as a good deed, then for him it is a sacred act of charity. The prophet also said, you will not spend anything seeking the favor of God without being rewarded for it, even what you provide for your wife. And there are many other opportunities. Here's another very beautiful story. The prophet related, while a man was walking, he became extremely thirsty. So he went down into a well and drank from it. Then he came out, only to find a panting dog eating moist earth in its thirst. The man said, The same thing has happened to this creature as has happened to me. So he filled his shoe, climbed out holding it in his teeth, and thus gave the dog water to drink. Then God thanked the man and forgave him. People asked, O messenger of God, are we rewarded for our treatment of animals? The prophet said, there is a reward for your treatment of every living thing. Now here is a, a nice saying which gives uh, something of a foretaste of what that reward is. The prophet said, God rendered mercy into a hundred parts, keeping ninety-nine parts and sending one part down to earth. By virtue of that one portion, creatures are merciful to one another, such that even the mare lifts her hooves away from her foal, fearing she may step on it. The prophet also said, whoever is not merciful will not be shown mercy. So one thing one can do while exercising uh, one's um, affinity with that one portion of mercy on earth is uh, cast one's mind up to that, uh, the 99 that were held back up in heaven. It sure beats drumming. <clears throat> now, uh, let's go to the home and family um, 
briefly, I will just touch upon the, shall we say, the center of this uh, unit, the husband-wife relationship. In the chapter on Rome, it says, And among the signs of God is having created for you mates from yourselves, that you may feel at home with them, and God put love and kindness between you. Surely, and that is a sign for a reflective people. And in the chapter on women, it says, Be reverent toward God, by whom you ask of each other, and be reverent toward relationships, for God is watching over you. <clears throat> now I'd like to read a passage from <clears throat> a writing of a, a distinguished uh, Spanish Muslim of the 13th century. Um, discussing the inner dimension of the relationship between a man and a woman in the context of explaining uh, the saying of the Prophet, the three things in this world have been made dear to me, women, perfume, and prayer, wherein is reposed the coolness of my eyes. Now the author says, explaining this statement about women, when man contemplates God in woman, his contemplation rests on that which is passive. If he contemplates God in himself, he contemplates God in that which is active. And when he contemplates God alone, without the presence of any form at all issued therefrom, his contemplation corresponds to a state of passivity in regard to God, without intermediary. Consequently, his contemplation of God in woman is most perfect, for it is then God as at once active and passive that he contemplates, whereas in the purely interior contemplation he contemplates God only in a passive way. So the prophet, benediction and peace be upon him, was to love women because of the perfect contemplation of God in them. One would never be able to contemplate God directly in the absence of all support for God's absolute essence is independent of worlds, but as divine reality is inaccessible in respect to absolute essence, and there is contemplation only in a substance, the contemplation of God in women is the most intense and the most perfect, and the union that is most intense is the conjugal act. He who loves women in this manner loves them by divine love, but he who loves them only by natural attraction deprives himself of the inherent knowledge of this contemplation. Well, I realize it might take a while uh, to develop this type of uh, mindfulness in the manhood of our nation, but do we really have a choice? Once again, can we really legislate away the kinds of abominations that men practice against women here? Apparently not. We do have laws. Uh, I think what we need is a change in heart, the way that people approach all of the relations, but particularly, especially, relation with one's mate, the most intimate relation in the world. Uh, now, of course, that's rather lofty. Let me come down to a level we can perhaps understand more immediately. Someone asked the widow of the prophet what the prophet used to do at home. She said, he used to remain occupied working for his family. Then he would go out when he heard the call to prayer. Now let me sum up some... Um, Teachings that are, have to do basically with your individual conscience and your individual conduct. In the Quran it says in the chapter, the epic, humanity is indeed at a loss, except those faith and do good works and enjoin truth and justice upon one another and enjoin patience upon one another. Now it says, person be doing it to people or death, so as can see, why one of those are. And a person be doing deep people health care, far as I can see, while I'm being with a people paradise. So it's really a matter of individual conscience. Lost for yourself. 
Now, just like um, charity is regarded as part of a very fundamental and basic uh, economic uh, <laughs> responsibility, similarly, uh, individual piety is commonly expressed in terms of social behavior, which is as much a form of worship, actually, as ritual performance are conventionally thought of as religious. Here's something else from saying to the prophet. Whoever believes in God in the last day should not wrong his neighbor, and whoever believes in God in the last day should treat his guests generously, and whoever believes in God in the last day should speak of good or keep silent. The prophet also said, all that is objectively recognized as good and fair is sacred charity. And he said, the best of you are the most good-natured. So religion isn't supposed to make you crabby <laughs> and nasty to your neighbors. <laughs> now here's one I think uh, very, very significant for us today. The prophet said, God disregards for me whatever insidious suggestion occurs to my people, as long as they do not act on it or express it in speech. God disregards for me whatever insidious suggestion occurs to my people, as long as they do not act on it or express it in speech. I think that's important for us today because the society we live in here is not merely simply a permissive society, as you often hear, is a suggestive society. Suggestion is pounded into us over the waves. And even what is not yet permitted is already being suggested. So I think that the uh, is uh, any sort of nonsense can go through one's head because all sorts of nonsense is actually projected through the even through the overt media. So if um, we are not able to uh, analyze it and dismiss it and understand it's real, uh, and, um, at least we can refrain from speaking about it and acting on it and thereby uh, promoting the actualization of insidious suggestion. So ignoring <laughs> insidious suggestion, I think, is one of the... <laughs> One of the best suggestions that the Prophet has for us today. Well, let me just conclude with a, a few general remarks. This has to do with um, the place of religion in everyday life and the, the melding of religion in everyday life. Again, going back to the, the first statement I read about the the idea of reintroducing the sense of the holy. Now in the Quran it says, there is, an, there is to be no compulsion in religion. There is to be no compulsion in religion. I realize that this is not um, the image of Islam that is commonly projected in the West. I think that uh, one reason for this is because religion in general, not just Islam, but, but religion in general here is um, often associated with compulsion and compulsiveness. Uh, partly, I think this might have to do with the history of this country and the reason why lots of the people originally came here had to do with religious persecution, which unfortunately and continued once they got onto these shores. But uh, I think that um, fanaticism and compulsiveness in religion, as in, in, in anything actually, tend to alienate tends to alienate the individual from other people and, the, of course, the group from the, the larger body society and uh, even tends to alienate the individual from his own real nature, I believe. So it says in the Quran, do excess in your religion. The Prophet said to his companion Abdullah, have I not been informed that you fast all day and stand in prayer all night? Abdullah replied, yes. O messenger of God. The prophet said, don't do that. Fast, then eat and drink. Stand in prayer, then sleep. For your body has a right over you, and your wife has a right over you, and your guest has a right over you. And I can't think of any better way to end than by quoting uh, from the ending of the 
the second chapter of the Quran, which again illustrates, I think, this attitude that religion is supposed to uplift us, not intimidate us and terrorize us. The Quran says, God does not compel a soul to do what is beyond its capacity. It gets what it has earned and is responsible for what it deserves. Our Lord, please do not punish us if we forget or we err. And please, our Lord, do not place on us a burden like that you put on those before us. And please, our Lord, do not make us carry that for which we lack the strength. And please grant us pardon and give us have mercy on us. You, Arpita, help against the ungrateful. Thank you, Arpita. Now, if, uh, from the audience, uh, this will be the time to bring them up. Please come to the mic, if you will. Oh, well, I guess we all have enough to think about tonight. That's good. We don't really have to do this ritual. <laughs> oh, please, step up to the mic. Uh, what I would like to hear you talk about a little bit is um, on the relationship of women in the uh, society. Mm-hmm. And I understand that women are not allowed in the mosque. Is that true? And if not, do they have any formal formal place or rituals in order to uh, worship or whatever? And then um, particularly, um, what is their... What is their a relationship in society? Women. Okay. Well, first I can quote the prophet saying, if your wife wants to go to the mosque, don't prevent her. So if any wives are prevented from going to the mosque, that's on their, that's on. their husbands have to answer the prophet for that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it is on record also the prophet did set aside a time, special time to, for the women to talk with him. I didn't um, talk a lot about the issue of women in society per se for a couple of reasons. It's one of those that's it's, it's one of the areas that is sort of clouded with lots of prejudice in Western society. Um, and uh, some of these prejudices are actually quite ugly. One thing is that if I uh, if I do speak about the women and those kinds of things, well, you're a you say, um, society in evolution evolves everywhere. I think it's rather mean to uh, open around this it does. It is um, It's about the being fooled and um, women being to each other. It also says uh, in the words of God, I certainly do not overlook the work of any worker among you, male or female. This seems to suggest the right of uh, women to work in society, for example. I read in a um, interesting book by a contemporary <coughs> Muslim writer on this particular subject, who said that uh, the uh, there are a minority, some Muslim women, who have um, objections to the traditional role in society. His estimation uh, of this is that it's because the men are unwilling to be men. So uh, I'd, rather, I'd, I'd like to conclude this with, with just by saying that uh, I don't see, I think we're from start to learn from Islam, just to start with on this one, is that we can't even really discuss the whole of the place of one gender delay because that isn't the way society really is. So, uh, how can we talk about the place of anybody in society unless we talk about the relates that people are with the other people in society? So um, I think our the real thing for us to ask ourselves is how we know to each other and if there's any we can better, how can we do better? So to me that is what you would there's a lot of us there's a lot of us things written upon this uh, specific issue, issue, so-called women's issue. Uh, but I think really it's, uh, the real issue is a uh, couple's issue, actually, how men and women get along with each other. Uh, outside of that, I don't see where, where there is any discussion, frankly speaking, of the place of men and women in society. Well, sorry about that. I know that was not terribly... Uh, what? Was that rough? Was that too rough? Was that too harsh? Anyone else? Yeah. Actually, the question I had was, um, oh, okay. Well, we're shouting. You talk about the um, 
historical interpretation of jihad and then maybe what the practical um, value of it is within Islamic spirituality and maybe how we could apply that here in understanding Islam better. Okay, okay jihad means struggle. Okay, struggle. Uh, oh, now, this actually brings up an interesting uh, answer to this former question. Uh, for women, that's actually a saying, for women, jihad is taking care of her husband. <laughs> 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 I didn't make that up. That's really true. That's a prophetic uh, statement. <laughs> now, I think there's quite a lot to that statement. Let's think about that a little bit. Um, but I won't go further. <laughs> I'll let you all meditate on that one. Yeah, uh, one of my favorite sayings of the Prophet on this subject is we've returned from the lesser struggle to the greatest struggle. And the lesser struggle is the struggle against uh, en- enemies of truth. You know, when uh, overt attempts to um, destroy uh, innocence and truthfulness, struggling against that is jihad. That's the lesser struggle. The greatest struggle is struggling against one's own egotism. <laughs> so, now I know that we certainly, uh, <laughs> we have discussions about this in our civilization here. And I think we definitely do need a more sense of jihad against our own ignorance and uh, willfulness. Or right, anyone else? Women and jihad. <laughs> should, should I have predicted that one? <laughs> no, I'm stuck on the day. Very, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you.